Hello, ladies and gentlemen. A big daddy top hat here, welcoming you to another exciting episode of Fighting Game Thursday. Amongst my cornucopia of content covering the fighting game genre, we have now looked at a crazy amount of different Capcom fighting games. To be fair though, that one company may have contributed more classics to the field than any other. An entity that is not too far behind though is of course a brand of whom we have covered on a few occasions when looking at their variety of ambitious crossover titles they created when working alongside Capcom. Of course I am talking about SNK, a company who could very much be considered Capcom's greatest fighting game rival when it came to publishers. But apart from creating competition for the company and contributing to the dream scenario that was the Capcom vs SNK games, the two companies' histories stretch deeper than that, all the way back to the birth of vs fighting games themselves. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the mad story of Fatal Fury King of Fighters, the game that is arguably the true Street Fighter 2. Yeah! As just mentioned, the history of Capcom and SNK is much more intertwined than many would think, and their history goes deeper than simply as competitors. In order to tell today's story, we have to start back in 1987, with the release of the original Street Fighter arcade game. The game is incredibly simple and basic by today's standards, but would be the first game in a series that would go on to form an entire dynasty. The game differs greatly from other installments, and for this reason many players seem to snub it nowadays. In this title, players play as the martial artist known as Ryu, as he competes in a world martial arts tournament spread across different countries, facing off against 10 opponents. This would be somewhat impractical these days with the spread of coronavirus and all. A second player can also join the fray and take part, when they take control of Ken, Ryu's blonde American rival. Despite the lack of colourful characters to players in this game, some of the tropes of Street Fighter, or fighting games in general, are formed within this title. The player could even perform three punches and kick attacks that varied in strength and speed along with three special moves including the famous Hadouken and Shryuken moves which were performed with certain button combinations. As mentioned in previous videos, although not well loved today, the game was a smash hit at the time and as a result would be ported to a variety of different formats so that consumers could bring the game home. Capcom made great money from the game and critics loved it. This would mean the development of a sequel to this fantastic game would be a must. The genius original Street Fighter game would be directed under the leadership of Takeshi Nishiyama and was designed by Hiroshi Matsumoto. These two men could be considered the two most important Capcom employees who worked on the title, with Matsumoto stating that the Hadouken move that he came up with was inspired by an energy missile attack from the 1970s anime series Space Battleship Yamamoto, or Yamato. I think I got it right that time. What may come as a surprise to some though is that Nishiyama would leave the company shortly after the release of the game, meaning that a different man would need to take the helm when it came to the development of any licensed sequel. In 1989, Capcom would try their luck with the Street Fighter brand when they attached the name Street Fighter 89 to one of their arcade cabinets that they were test marketing at trade shows. The response to this was negative, as the high quality side scrolling beat em up in question related little to the original Street Fighter game. So Capcom would go with the name Final Fight, and the release of a new Street Fighter game would be shelved for another day. As we know, that day would finally come in 1991 with the release of Street Fighter 2 The World Warrior a game by now we all know enough about, not to need to immediately cover any further, but the game's impact was undeniable. Interestingly though, that very same year another game would see release, that could easily be argued as the true successor to the first Street Fighter game. 
with that game of course being SNK's Fatal Fury King of Fighters, a brand new fighting game directed by Street Fighter creator Takashi Nishiyama, an arguably true sequel to the beloved 1987 Street Fighter was finally here. Apart from being the game itself that Nishiyama envisioned as the sequel to Street Fighter, the game is also notable for a number of other reasons too. Fatal Fury King of Fighters is, as you would expect, a head-to-head -head fighting game, but more importantly, is the first title in a series that would spawn many sequels. There were multiple Fatal Fury games over the years, and many of the characters would be included in the franchise's even more successful spin-off series of games, simply titled as The King of Fighters. Fatal Fury King of Fighters is an important crossroad in fighting game history that would lead to Capcom-owned Street Fighter's Greatest Rival series. But enough about that for now, let's focus in on the game in question. Fatal Fury's gameplay includes many of the tropes you would think of when it comes to fighting games today. Simple ideas that would almost be considered formulaic by now. This includes best of 2 out of 3 falls matches and controlling the player using the directional joystick paired with 3 attack buttons. The 3 buttons in Fatal Fury's case are used for punching, kicking and throwing. Alongside these simple manoeuvres players can also execute special techniques by inputting specific button combinations. To help assist the player in achieving this, Fatal Fury took the novel approach of showing the player the input methods over the course of the game, or more specifically, after bonus rounds, which we shall touch more on soon. Personally, I like this approach to the gameplay, as I see no reason why a passerby in an arcade would possibly know how to execute such moves. Thinking about it, many fighting game cabinets would simply feature control methods as part of the unit's artwork, but I guess this was not an option when it came to Fatal Fury, as the title would run on a Neo Geo MVS arcade unit. Uniform arcade cabinets that had interchangeable cartridge slots, allowing arcade vendors to cost-effectively swap games without the need of an entire new cabinet. Technology that was hugely come into play with the success that SNK would find throughout the 90s. Completely different though from the majority of fighting games, Fatal Fury would feature what is known as two-lane battles. Basically, this meant that a large proportion of stages in the game would feature two-row combat, a background row and a foreground row. This would mean at times players had the ability to change between these two rows. The exception to this is in the single player mode, where players have to wait for the computer controlled opponent to change rows before they can in the majority of the stages. As mentioned previously, this game was envisioned as the sequel to the 1987 Street Fighter game, so as you can see there are many mechanical differences to that of which fighting games would become more synonymous with that would become more entrenched with the release of Capcom Street Fighter 2. Apart from the two-lane system which differs from more modern fighters, the two-player aspect of the game also differs greatly from that of which we associate with fighting game franchises. In Fatal Fury, if a second player joins in, fights are not postponed in a battle to allow for a one-on-one -on -one match between the two players, but instead the two players get to team them up against the CPU opponent essentially allowing for two-on-one handicap matches, again a feature that I do not recall arising in the Street Fighter franchise until the release of the poorly received Street Fighter EX3 many years later. Apart from the bouts themselves, when taking part in single player tournaments there are also as mentioned bonus rounds to take part in. These bonus rounds occur after every two matches and are basically mini-games that involve elements such as arm wrestling against a machine, which involves tapping a button rapidly. Now we have gone over a few of the gameplay features, I guess it would be important to touch on the game's story and fighting game roster. Much like 1987 Street Fighter, the plot of Fatal Fury revolves around the simple premise of a martial arts tournament. This event is known as the King of Fighters Tournament and is held in a fictional American city known as Southtown. To give the story a little more depth, the tournament is sponsored by a crime boss known as Geese Howard. 
Ten years prior to the events of the game, Gies murdered his martial arts rival, Jeff Bogard, to ensure that he remained the world's number one fighter. This leads us onto the inclusion of the game's small lineup of playable fighters. The game follows in the original Street Fighter game's footsteps, offering only a few playable characters, up in controllable fighters from two to three at least though. These include Jeff Bogard's adopted sons Andy and Terry Bogard, along with their longtime friend Joe Higashi. All three men entered the tournament in the hopes of getting their revenge against Geese Howard, offering up a very simple to digest plot. In terms of the three playable fighters, Terry Bogard, who has become somewhat of a mascot for SNK, is an American martial artist. His younger brother, Andy Bogard, specializes in Kopo Jutsu, which he learned in Japan, and Joe Higashi is a Japanese Muay Thai expert. One assumes, just like with Ken and Ryu before them, Nishiyama opted for playable fighters who were appealing to both Japanese and Western consumers alike. Within this game, before reaching Geese Howard, players must defeat seven other AI-controlled opponents. These include Duck King, a street dancer with a rhythmical fighting technique, a capoeira master known as Richard Mayer, Michael Max, a boxer with a projectile attack, Raiden, a heel wrestler who uses the infamous Japanese poison mist technique, Hua J, a Mutoi master who uses enhancement drugs to give him special techniques, Tung Fu Wu, a Bajuk Kwan expert masquerading as a meek elderly man, and of course, Dave Perry, an undefeated champion who loves bikini babes and struggles with the ice stage of Mario 64. Once a player has thought their way through this colourful lineup of enemies, only then do they get to face off against Geese Howard, the final boss of the game who has an Aikido fighting style and the ability to use an attack similar to Terry's power wave. As you can now probably see from all of this, Fatal Fury King of Fighters was a decent little game that would pioneer the way forward for many SNK games. And if you have watched this video, you will easily be able to see that the game has a lot more in common with the 1987 Street Fighter game than the Capcom release sequel of Street Fighter 2. Despite all of this though, the game in 1991 was greatly, greatly overshadowed by Street Fighter 2 The World Warrior, as rather than being a game that was heavily built on many of the mechanics of its predecessor, the game varied so greatly that the title was pretty much its own beast. Street Fighter 2 was such a popular impressive game that, as we know, it would even lead to somewhat of a renaissance for the entire arcade industry and the game was so prevalent that it left many fans at the time wondering why they had never played the first game in the series. The popularity of Street Fighter 2, paired with the fact that Nishiyama developed both the original Street Fighter game and Fatal Fury, would cause the majority of journalists of publications from the period to compare the two games directly. To this day, it is still an obvious comparison to make, with Maximum, for example, retrospectively commenting that the game failed to offer any real competition for Street Fighter 2 in either playability or character selection. Concluding, the only main point in this game's favour is that two of the characters may team together to take on a computer opponent in a three-player frenzy, and the game also tries to offer something else new with a two-tier playing arena. But the slow action and the disgracefully difficult fireball motions make special moves something of a rare occurrence. Still though, despite all of this, it is a rather unfair comparison when you consider that Street Fighter 2 would go on to change the entire fighting game genre, a luxury at the time of its development that Nishiyama had no opportunity to build on in the same ways that many fighting game developers would down the line post the first Fatal Fury game. Aside from all of this though, reviews for the game at the time were pretty strong, which would mean aside from the MVS release and the obvious expensive yet perfect home version of the game on the Neo Geo AES, the game would also receive ports to a number of home platforms, each of which would receive varying levels of success and decent execution. Obviously no version would be as good as those on Neo Geo hardware, 
especially considering that the AES could probably deliver the best home console experience on planet Earth at the time, but developers would try their best with other hardware. The first of these ports would appear on the Super Nintendo in 1992. This version of the game was developed by Nova and published by Takara. Interestingly, this version of the game completely drops the two-lane system in favour of a much more conventional single plane, which in my opinion was a decision that was clearly made in an attempt to make the game appear more like Street Fighter 2. To make it even more Street Fighter-y, two on one bouts were also removed and the bonus round featuring arm wrestling was also taken out of the game in favour of a stage where the player punches flying tyres in a stage that is somewhat reminiscent of the barrel bonus stage found in Street Fighter 2. The final huge and welcome change was that in the game's versus mode, players now had the ability to control all of the previously uncontrollable CPU fighters, all in all altering the game so that it drastically by this point could be argued that the game had become a Street Fighter 2 clone. It is quite hilarious when you think about it that Fatal Fury was designed as a spiritual successor to Street Fighter, directed by Nishiyama, to later be altered when it made it to home consoles to make the title more like Capcom's next Street Fighter game, a title that Nishiyama had nothing to do with. Poetic stuff really. The next year of 1993 the game would make it to the Sega Mega Drive, published directly by Sega themselves. This version of the game shares a lot of similarities with the SNES version, but Hua Jay and Dave Perry had been removed from the lineup of CPU opponents in the single player mode and had been replaced with whichever of the two main characters the player does not select. An equally decent version of the game would also see release on the Sharp X68000 Japanese computer, this time produced by Magical Company. In my opinion, the Sharp X68000 is probably the most underrated gaming platform on planet Earth, the definition of a hidden gem among systems. So, ladies and gentlemen, there you have it, the mad story of Fatal Fury, King of Fighters, Nishiyama's follow-up to his 1987 Street Fighter game, that would be repackaged to be more Capcom Street Fighter 2-like when it made it home to both Nintendo and Sega platforms. As you will probably know, this is only one of many SNK fighting games and provided this video finds a level of popularity, I look to cover the history of many more on here in the future. Let me know in the comment section down below what you thought of today's video and which fighting game you would like to hear me cover next. If you want more videos like this, please do not forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell to receive a new video like this straight to your phone every Thursday. Finally, my channel is partially funded by the generous donations I receive via Patreon. Patrons can earn a credit and a shout out at the end of these videos, including new producer credits at the beginning of these titles too. These people make working full time on YouTube just that little bit easier. So huge shout outs go out to Carl Johnson, Sebastian Veles, Sponge Matt B, House of the Ted, JD Robbins, Synth Spaces, Andrew Bazansky, Asobi Quang DX, Michael Baker, Tom Elliott, Computer Man, Antonio Rodriguez, Craig Jenkins, Daniel Daly, Retroversing.com, Dan Barlow Jr., Joel, and all of my other patrons. Yeah, ta-ta and farewell.